I was thinking this week of a, a phrase that can be startling and angering and relieving at the same time. Now, let me illustrate. Imagine a son or a, a daughter who comes into a dad or a mom and walks up and says, Dad or Mom, I, I don't know how to tell you this, but I, I took the keys to the car and I, and I got in it and I backed up and I went across the street and I hit the neighbor's mailbox and I knocked it over and, and I've torn up the car. Now, and in that moment, the response might be, oh, no, or for some it might be what I'm fixing to do to you. But then here comes the phrase, I was just kidding. You know, all of a sudden, what was built up inside is gone because a statement presented as true suddenly becomes false. And it may come in the form of, oh, I was just joking or I was just playing around with you. And, you know, we have those, and we do do those, particularly on April the 1st of every year. But, but I want to tell you something today. You will never, ever, ever, ever hear God saying, I was just kidding. You'll never hear Jesus, after having given us a command, say, oh, I was just joking with you. Don't worry about it. Now, we acknowledge that and say that, but here's the reality. When it comes to the commands of God's Word, we sometimes have a tendency to categorize them. We may say, whoa, this one is one we better do. Or we look at another and say, well, you know, it's kind of optional. I might do it. Or we may even look at one and say, that's no big deal. I don't have to worry about that one. Last week, Matt Hess was here, and, and he shared with us. And I, you know, I really like Matt a lot, and he and his wife, Erica, have gone out and planted a church and are just doing wonderful work through the empowerment of the Spirit and to bring glory to God. And, and that which Matt shared about, and, and we had a chance to visit a little bit beforehand, that which he shared about and, and was evident in what he, he, uh, he shared and so passionate in his life is evangelism, is sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. And when Matt shared last Sunday and he shared from Scripture, it really hit me hard because, you see, here's the reality. Evangelism is a word that we throw around, we hear it, we use it and all, but a lot of times we avoid it. And, you know, some approach it this way. Well, you know, I, I share my faith by the way I live. Well, let me begin with this. You're supposed to, Okay. So that's okay, but here's the problem. For too many people, that becomes a substitute for sharing the gospel verbally. I'll just live this way and people will see who I am. Well, that's a good thing, but you don't see anywhere in Scripture where it says just go out there and do good deeds and they'll know who you are. Now, I'm all in favor of digging water wells and giving shoes to needy people and all that, but if it does not have as its purpose sharing the gospel, then all you're doing is meeting a physical need. What you see in Scripture, what Jesus gives us here, is you always approach those needs of life with the purpose of sharing the love of Jesus Christ and sharing the gospel with those people. So I want to share about that today because I think that when we understand that, that, that at the heart of everything we do has to be the gospel. Everything, people, in the church, in life, and everything else, the, the gospel has to be the center. When we come to understand that we begin to understand evangelism and we begin to begin to understand discipleship now it, it, it's interesting time won't allow us today but for instance in the southern baptist faith if you trace our history particularly in the last uh probably 60 to 70 years here's what you'll see that we have times at which we focus on evangelism and not so much on discipleship and then we'll focus on discipleship and and not so much evangelism and you'll see periods in which there is this great increase in baptisms and then periods in which the numbers of baptisms decrease let me tell you what scripture says evangelism and discipleship are totally interconnected and intertwined and inseparable for each other you, we have to be conscious of both and approach both. And so today I want to talk about that. I'm going to be sharing from Matthew 28. I already told the children about it. You've already turned there. Go ahead and turn to Matthew 28. I want to walk through this passage with you, but on a little broader basis than what we often do. Because I want us to look at the setting of what's taking place here as Jesus shares what we know is the Great Commission in verses 19 and 20. But let's look a little bit more at what's happening here by looking first at verse 16. 
Matthew chapter 28, verse 16. Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had appointed for them. Now you won't find anywhere in scripture or history where it tells us the exact mountain they went to, but Jesus had told them this is where you need to go. And so they went there, and he, he had, this is about 40 days post-resurrection. And during this time, Jesus had appeared to about 500 or more of his followers. Now I'm going to just share a passage, and we'll have it on the screen, in which we learn that. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, here's what it says. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he was seen by Cephas, then by the twelve. After that, he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remained to the present, but some have fallen asleep. And after that, he was seen by James, and then by all the apostles. And so what happened now is these 11 disciples have gathered together, and they're going to be with Jesus and he's taken them there now it doesn't mean that there weren't others with him there because it's going to be obvious in a moment that there were others that were there but he's sharing this with as many of his followers as possible and, and what he shares in Matthew 28 he shares with us today look at verse 17 when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Now, and I don't think any of those 11 disciples doubted Jesus. Even Thomas, who had had his face strengthened by Jesus, doesn't doubt in any way. But some in this group doubt him. Now, you and I might say, how on earth could they do that? To which I would say, look around. We're surrounded in this world by people who refuse to believe in the identity and the nature and the purpose of Jesus Christ. And even in his midst, there were some who continued to doubt and wonder, is he really who he says he is? But it's in that setting that Jesus shares what we call the Great Commission. And the first thing he does is that he shares the authority upon which it is issued. Now look at verse 18. Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. And let me tell you something. Over my lifetime, I've read verses 19 and 20 hundreds of times. A lot of folks in here have. If you were a royal ambassador, you heard it every single week. I've seen it on banners. I've seen it all over the place. I've heard preachers preach about it, all those other things. And I, almost without exception, here's what's preached. Verses 19 and 20. Let me tell you, friends, don't ever, ever go to verses 19 and 20 without reading verse 18. It is critical, critical not only to the message that we get, but to how we take that message out to the world. Before Jesus gave this commission, he said, let me tell you why I can give this commission. He said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Now, the Greek word for authority here is exousia. And it's a word that means power and might, and it means delegated authority. And, and in the broadest sense, then, it would mean the absolute right to speak and act as you please. Now, what it tells us here is that the sovereign authority that Jesus Christ has been given has been given by the sovereign authority of his heavenly Father, which is absolute and universal. And so what he's given to Jesus as this authority is also absolute and universal. And it's really interesting when you step back and you begin to look at this, that this is not a revelation that comes in this particular moment. In fact, way back in Daniel, Daniel says when he comes, let me tell you what he's going to have. Now, I'm going to put them on the screen. If you want to turn there, good verses to know. Daniel chapter 7. Turn to your left in your Bible. Daniel chapter 7.
verses 13 and 14, here's what it says. I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. He came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. And then, listen carefully, then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and lang languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom the one which shall not be destroyed. Now he's saying, when Jesus comes, understand this. He's not coming halfway. He's not coming sort of. He's coming fully clothed in the authority that's been given to him by his heavenly Father. That's borne out in another verse in the New Testament. Listen to what it says in John 3.35. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. Now, we need to understand that when Jesus says this, this is not a matter of kinship. This is a matter of absolute authority from one who has absolute authority. And so when he gives this command, this commission, he's doing it as one who has the absolute right to look to you and to look to me and to say, this is what you need to go and do. And so when we see that, here's what it tells us, that following this command is not an option, it's an obligation. But not understanding this can have dramatic and direct effect on how we do follow his command. And I, I want to tell you, I believe one of the greatest pitfalls that exists in our world today to people sharing their faith is not understanding the authority under which we do share that faith. Why is that? Well, let's just suppose we leave verse 18 out just for a moment just it's not there and so jesus says says this he he tells us the command that we are to go out and make disciples without verse 18 here's what it says go out on your own authority with your own acknowledgement with your own ability and go make disciples you see when we share the gospel with someone we're not doing it on our own authority there's not one thing in the good news of Jesus Christ that I came up with. And there's not one thing in the gospel of Jesus Christ that you came up with. God himself did it. I've been the recipient of it. I can give a personal testimony as to the power of it, but I didn't come up with it. So when I look into the eyes of someone and I share the good news of Jesus Christ, I'm not doing it on my own authority. I'm doing it on the very authority of the one who gave his life so that we could be saved. And I cannot walk into a lost world and, and say, oh, I hope they believe me. I don't want them to believe me. I want them to believe Jesus Christ. That's the gospel. And I walk in with the authority. And, and without that, we go out there, oh, are they going to reject me? Are they going to ridicule me? They may not like what I say. Friends, when the gospel comes out of my mouth and your mouth, it comes out with the authority of Jesus Christ himself into a life in which the Holy Spirit's already working. Is that incredible? They can reject it. They can ridicule me. They can ridicule you. They can turn away from it. But Jesus never predicates one time anywhere in Scripture our sharing the gospel on whether somebody believes it, accepts it or not. It's not our job. Don't want to burst your bubble. It is never going to be your job, ever. And we should not share the gospel without remembering the words of verse 18. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. And when we understand the authority of the command, then we can move to the nature of the command. Now let's read verses 19 and 20 that we're familiar with. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Now that's what we know is the Great Commission. Somebody says, ask you about the Great Commission, primarily, although it appeared in different forms in the Gospels. This is generally the one that we go to and the one that we share. And when Jesus says, go therefore, it is a transition from verse 18 in which he says, all authority has been given to me, and because all authority has been given to me, you need to go out, share the gospel, make disciples, baptize people. 
In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And, and the, the central command of this is, is to make disciples. And, you know, I read through this. I find it to be an incredible insight into what Jesus wants for me and you as his followers. It's not a command to simply believe. It's not a command to simply accept. It's a command to place one's trust in Jesus Christ as the only means of forgiveness and to give to him our lives as we continually obey and learn. And Jesus tells us that the acceptance of the gospel is not just a ticket to heaven. It is a means of transforming a life and continually growing spiritually into what we are to become. And we need to understand that as we talk about the Great Commission because you see for some folks the Great Commission, let's go out there and tell them about Jesus and then adios. Let's go out there and as soon as they pray the prayer, everything's done, I got another one, let's go. That's not what he's saying. He's saying make disciples. Now understand this, inherent in making disciples is sharing the gospel. I will guarantee you nobody on earth can make a disciple of Jesus Christ if they don't tell them about the gospel. But when we do that, then we are to grow disciples. And, and, and the uniqueness of Jesus' command is that it's, it combines evangelism and discipleship together. And when we step back from this, what we see is that God created the church to be the primary vehicle through which the Great Commission is carried out. And Jesus is saying, as my followers, you to be the instruments of making disciples for me you know I was working on this sermon and I I couldn't help but think of a couple of verses and I, we'll put them up here the, the, the first is first John 2 6 just a short little verse but my goodness it, it says this he who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked now that's as straightforward as it gets if you say you're his act like him be like him and him be as Jesus. Now I want you to turn to the turn to Matthew chapter four. Matthew chapter four, verses eighteen and nineteen. Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. So, so Jesus says to them, follow me, and you're going to do what I do. Now, when I was reading this, and, and it's happened several times, and talks about fishers of men, I couldn't help but think back to my childhood and growing up. We had a 200-acre farm, and... Uh, had all kind of animals and stuff and my grandfather was retired and he and my grandmother lived beside us and my grandfather's priority of life after faith and family was a three and a half acre pond and every day he went down there and he fed the fish and took care of the fish and I mean you'd go down there anytime any place you could catch fish so guess what we ate all the time fish now Paul I love you friend but I want you to understand this I don't fish okay we got some great fisher people in this church, men and women. If you said, Doug, give me your top 100, I'm sorry, bro. Fishing is not on it. However, when you get in the context of evangelism, we have to understand that choosing not to be fishers of men is not a choice. We can't look out there and say, well, you know, I'm not comfortable with that. I'm not good around people. I'm not good with words, whatever it might be. And I'm not belittling that. That may be personality. But here's the folks. Go back to verse 18. It don't make any difference if I'm bad at it. I got the authority of Jesus Christ within me, the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, who says you're going to have to work hard not to be a witness to me everywhere you go. And so when we look at the Great Commission, I, I believe it's so important that we look at the time that it was given. Now Jesus has been resurrected 40 days and he's appeared here and there and we've already read 500 plus people have seen him. And if, and if, you, if we could caption this, we could call this Jesus' farewell address. 
Now we know that the Holy Spirit's going to arrive and remind people, believers, of what Jesus said. We know that Jesus is going to return. But, but under, let's understand this. This is the last face-to-face -face Jesus is going to have with his followers. And the Holy Spirit's going to come, be his presence with them. But this is it. Now, what do you say? Hey, y'all remember that time we were down over here in that wedding and they needed some more wine? Remember that time that guy couldn't walk? No. He wasn't concerned with that. He said, I'm fixing to leave. I'm going to tell you what needs to happen now. And in the shortest form, but the most important form, he says, listen up, everybody. Here it is. Go out there and make disciples. Teach them the things that I've taught you. And understand this. You don't get it now, but when the Holy Spirit comes, I'm going to be with you every single step you take. Just think about it. Three years he's been teaching. He's taught and he's preached and he's gone around. He's been ridiculed, rejected, tortured, crucified. And with all that behind him, he moves on to what's truly important. And he doesn't waste a moment on what used to be. He addresses what needs to be. And followers of Jesus Christ can read his words and accept his words and approve of his words. But if we stop there, we have missed the message. What has to be addressed is the nature of the response. Now, now, this is the great commission given by Jesus. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you, and, lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. So how do we respond? What, what do we do? You know, a few minutes ago I read from Matthew 4, and Jesus goes to, to Peter and Andrew, and he says, hey, you need to come with me. I'm going to make you fishers of men. In that moment, Jesus issued to them the Great Commission. He said, here's the deal. You need to go. Or what do you do? Here's what they did in verse 20. They immediately left their nets and followed him. Immediately. Why didn't he tell us that? Didn't they want to go tell other people? Didn't they want to go close their bank accounts? Didn't they want to go pack their luggage? And they wanted to follow him. They wanted to do what he said to do. And so their response was immediate. And folks, when we read the Great Commission, let me tell you up front, this is not something we reduce to thought. We don't reduce it to waiting. We don't reduce it to preparation. We do it. We are just to follow. And everything that you and I do in our lives has to be viewed through the lens of the Great Commission. Just how important is it? I, I thought a lot about that. I said, man, oh, man, how, how can I show you, stress to you how important this Great Commission is, how important it is to share the gospel with people, how important it is to grow them in their faith. And I want to show you the results of the Great Commission because what I will share and show with you it's so much better than any words that I can share. Let me tell you something, friends. Every single person in those baptistry waters was there because of the Great Commission. Somebody, a mom, a dad, a grandparent, a friend, a Sunday school teacher, pastor whoever it was somebody said i'm going to do what the great commission said let me tell you how important it is it has eternal consequences it it is that which changes from spiritual death to eternal life and those pictures that we share up there they tell us it's that important it's that important in Families, it's that important in this city, it's that important in this state, it's that important in this nation, it's that important in this world. And we have to be cognizant of that. But let me tell you something that's so important today. If I told you about the Great Commission, and I showed you a picture of the Great Commission, and we walked out here and said it's important, that'd be okay. But here's what's really important. Somebody in here, somebody in here, may not have heard it. Let me tell you something. God loves you so much. 
He doesn't love me more than you. He doesn't love anybody in that video more than you. And his heart is that he would give to you what he can only give to you. And you have to be able to turn to him and accept it. And what we shared here is that that which you can never be, you can become through Jesus Christ. And that which could never happen without his sacrifice can happen if you believe. And when you believe and you say he gave his life for me, I'll give my life to him. And so today, if you just listen to that and hear that, then you've heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. And now what happens is that you have to face that choice. Because God is sovereign. He has given to humanity the ability to say, I'll pass. And it pains his heart as nothing we can imagine. But he says, that which I desire more than anything else is faith. And the only way you can have faith is choice. And so right now, through his spirit, somebody here, if you don't know him, he's saying to you, you got to choose. you got to decide. Is it going to be me? Is it going to be wait? Is it going to be no? And let me make sure you understand. If you open your heart to him and you say, I believe, genuinely believe, and you ask for forgiveness and repent and receive that gift, we're going to wrap you up in discipleship. We will not let you sit stagnant because our responsibility is to take that which only God can do and to feed it and tend it and grow it to bring him glory. You bow your heads with me. Father, today in this place,